following is an encore presentation of People Are Talking from this past year. Live from San Francisco, it's Channel 5's People Are Talking with Ann Fraser and Ross McGowan. What a nice warm welcome. Good morning. Welcome to People Are Talking. Thank God it's Friday. It is Friday. Ooh. I Something exciting happened on this program yesterday, and i got to tell you about it. It came up where I told the story of the crush I had on Miss Rowe, my third grade teacher. I don't know if anybody heard that. I went to Lake Merced School. Um, thir this, we're talking 1951. I was in the... Th I know you're surprised. You thought... <laughs> I was in the third grade, 1951. 1951? Yes. Not 61. Lake Merced School here in San Francisco. Miss Rowe, wow, was she, was she great. she gorgeous? Yeah. Do you know what happened after the show yesterday? Guess who called? <laughs> who called? Miss Rowe. No? <laughs> <laughs> Told you. Her sister called and said she was blown away by the fact that I had mentioned it, that Miss Rowe, uh, she said, well, Janice is in Europe. I said, who's Janice? She said, that's Miss Rowe. I said, we were not on you first name basis back then. No, no, no. But she's in Europe, she'll be home in, in a few days, and she's gonna bring her down to the show, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. She said, what's funny about this is I remember when Janice was at Lake Merced School, and she told about these uh, two young boys who always caused trouble in class. And one of them was little Ross. <laughs> yeah, she remember. You think that was you? Uh, I, she said, Were you always Miss in Rowe liked me, but I always talked too you much. Did? And she said, I little can't Ross, imagine she that. never put two and two together that Ross McGowan yeah. on TV was the little Ross her sister. You talk too about. much? Yeah. Surprising. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine that. Well, not you? when you're around. Oh, but please. <laughs> Well, uh, so often those of us in television are accused of not providing compelling television programs. Well, our guest this morning is the definition of compelling. Mm. Uh, she will make you laugh. Uh, she might make you cry. She definitely will make you think. She is one of life's cheerleaders. And what's wonderful, all her wisdom and her experience is based on reality. Ladies and gentlemen, Maya Angelou. <laughs> It's hard. We're television people. We don't want to gush too much, but we could gush a lot <laughs> when you come on the show. I too. I too for you. I mean, you people are are famous. Oh no. No, because you, the electricity you you which is created between the two of you, wonderful. I mean, a, a very friendly electricity, so that viewers sitting in San Mateo and in Stockton and places like that are warmed and heartened by you. And it's really because of the electricity. Well, thank you. Oh, How nice place. of you I to like say. I like to gush. I yeah. think gushing is... <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Do you know, we just, uh, probably many of you did, heard Barbara Bush's commencement speech at, mm. at Wellesley. And one of the things she said was, go out and follow your dreams, be career women, do whatever, but don't forget to find the joy in life. That's right. That's it. You must start with that as your as your aim. Not frivolity always, but sometimes frivolity mm -hmm. too. <clears throat> but joy is what I sign always in every book, in every uh, autograph, everything I end with joy. Because it is a kind of umbrella word. It means health. It means focus. It means commitment. It means friendship. It means religion if you have that. Romance. It's everything. It's really an umbrella word. Mm -hmm. So if you say, I'm out for joy, I mean joy. That means I take responsibility for the time I take up, for the space I occupy. I am out for joy. Yes. How did you react? Uh, well, 
How did you react when a certain segment of the, uh, the women at Wellesley said, we don't want Barbara Bush, she has gotten her fame in essence through her husband and not on her own? Well, it's, it's sad to me to uh, see any person uh, uh, rejected or even accepted because of a label. You see, <clears throat> people put label, labels on human beings so they don't have to deal with the humanity. They just say, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a Jew. Oh, that's a kike. Oh, that's a nigger. Oh, that's a Jap. Oh, that's a faggot. Oh, that's a les. Oh, that's a, an old person. Oh, that's a kid. You see? Then you don't have to say, oh, this person longs for Easter and, and the, the Easter bunny and is afraid of the dark and the heart pumps just as hard in that person as it does in me. So when you look and say, oh, this is somebody's wife and that's, that's all she is, it's just a label. It says I don't have to deal with the human being behind that label. And that's unfortunate. Not only, I mean, it's mainly unfortunate for the people who put the labels on people. It's not, I mean, it's bad to be labeled, admitted, and rejected or neglected or abused because of a label. But the people who put the labels on are the ones whose lives are narrowed down into mean little corners and alleyways. So it's so sadder for them, in a way. And I would think they were talking to her about the fact that she'd put so much emphasis on family yeah. and not enough on a high-powered career, but family as you have yeah. said so many times, is so important. Well, uh, you have to wonder to what end. Always to ask oneself self, to what end. If you are out for a great career, to what end? That is not all there is. Is that all there is? So <clears throat> if your intention is to have a marvelous career, to be resplendent in, uh, in responsibility and capability and efficiency and all that, to what end? So what? There's an African statement which is, the trouble for the thief is not how to steal the chief's bugle, but where to blow it. <laughs> <laughs> you see, not just how to get the career, but so what? What will you do with it? And if it does not serve family and other human beings, it is to no valid end. Yeah. I think, I think. <laughs> Maya, you spent a number of years, I don't know exactly how many years, um, as a child, not speaking. Yeah. How many? <laughs> it doesn't seem like any now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was about five years a mute. And what brought that on? Um, I had been raped as a child. And, um, and the, um, when I, I gave the name of the rapist, um, he was found dead a few days later. And I thought that my voice had killed a man. I was seven and a half, so I mean, the seven and a half year old logic is pretty weak. And so I decided if I spoke, I might injure somebody. So I just stopped talking. And then after a while, I loved it. I mean, I forgot <laughs> why. I just, muteness is, is like a, a, a drug, I think. It's so addictive, it's wonderful. Talk about Mrs. Flowers, because during this period yes. that you were mute, Mrs. Flowers and Dickens That's played right. heavily into yes. this. Yes, Mrs. Flowers was this gorgeous black woman in my town, a little town in Arkansas, about as big as this part of the stage. <laughs> <clears throat> and she was that beautiful black, that blue black, which seems, if you put your fingernail on it, it would peel, just gorgeous. And she had a wonderful voice, and she talked like that. And she wore dresses sort of like this, you know, that moved. And she was just the prettiest thing I'd seen, except my mother and, <laughs> and my grandma. Mrs. Flowers read to me, and she encouraged me to read poetry and to say, I mean, to read it. After a while, Mrs. Flowers asked me, she, she told me, you don't like poetry. And I had a tablet I'd write everything on. I love poetry. She said, you will never love it. And she pointed her finger at me. Ross, and there is something in black America which very few non-blacks know, and, and many blacks don't even articulate. But it, it crosses every social, uh, economic, age uh, group we have. 
we do not like to be pointed at. One of our phrases, you grow up knowing, don't put your finger in my face. I mean, now don't, don't do that. Now you can. So, so nice people never do that. And Mrs. Flowers was very nice. She came, she pointed at me. She said, you, I can't even do it to anybody. And she said, you don't like, you will never like it. I wept, I went running from the house like a banshee. She followed me, she harassed me, putting her finger in my face. She said, until you have it come across your tongue, through your teeth, across your lips, you will never love poetry. <sighs> Finally, after about six months, I went under the house, and I tried, and I had a voice. I was so amazed. When <laughs> you hear your own voice, it's like hearing yourself on a tape recorder. Do I sound like that? And I think I haven't quite stopped talking since then. So that was the, the moment that broke your silence. Yes. And we broke will continue with your talking after this commercial break. <laughs> Be right you. back with more of my uh... What a wonderful Friday. We're sharing some moments with Maya Angelou this morning. You know, I was just saying to you in the break, I got a letter from a dear friend of mine, or actually a friend of hers and of mine together, and telling me that a friend of mine, my own age, is very, very ill. And um, mm. she's encouraged me to write her back and say something. And I'm kind of at a loss yes. at this point. I'm feeling uncomfortable. I, I don't know how to broach the subject, how yes. to say, I know you're gravely ill. That's it. What can I do, you know? Yes, but you shouldn't even ask, I think. I don't know. Um, I have a, my darling, my ma, who is my sweetheart, uh, is sick. She's healing, I'm happy to say. Uh, I don't think one needs to put the burden of what can I do on somebody who's doing everything she or he can do to resist dis-ease. Um, I think you simply say, I'm sending you my strength. I'm sending you laughter. I'm sending you power. I'm sending you health from my mind to yours. I believe that's what you do. And always I'm sending you love. You see, Anne, love is not much. A lot of people, you, we have misused the word. I suggest, now this is going to sound like whatever it sounds like, but I suggest that love is that element in the universe which holds the molecules together. It is that thing. It is courage. It is that thing which encourages us to build bridges and then to cr trust the bridges we have built and cross them. Oh, across a span of an uh, abysmal chasm, cross them. I think that that's what love is. So when you say, I send you love, Ma, I mean, you're s sending something. This is no play matter, you see? And so I think to say to a friend, I know you are ill, and, and I care for you, so I'm sending you all I've got. There's nothing more than that, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and I think we all get real frustrated. We turn on the, the radio, we watch television, see the news, the hatred and the rape and the violence and the cheating and the lying and the stealing. And you kind of sit back and say, What, what can the? I do? Well, oh, or, can, it, can it be or done? Or can I do anything? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, um, in the Christian Bible, Judeo Christian Bible, there is the encouragement that all virtues begin at home. I believe that is so, and I think it is said in Shintoism and Buddhism and Islam and Judaism and everywhere. All virtues begin at home. If that is so, then all vices begin at home. So everything starts here. So what I can do at first is do for myself first. I can make myself as kind and as generous and as fair 
and as just and maybe even as merciful as possible. And then that might spread abroad. Maybe I can do that for Joe, a little bit for Flo, and some for Mo. Mm -hmm. You understand? Know <laughs> but it must start here. So when, when we begin to feel frustrated, when we think of the, the masses of, of people that one should help. So if, I think if we start step by step, it is uh, wise, and, and we have a chance of having some success. And nothing succeeds like success and even excess. <laughs> in commenting about racism in this country, you were saying there was a point in history where we were fingertip to fingertip. Almost. Eye to eye. Almost, yes. That we've had a number of times like that in our, in our American history. Uh, from the oh, early 1800s, when uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to some friends and said, let us send these people home, the Africans, the slaves. He said, it will take them five generations to forgive us for what we've done to them. And it will take them five generations to, um, um, and it will take us five generations to er eradicate the erroneous idea that they are inferior. Let us do this now. It didn't happen. Ben Benjamin Banneker, and he had a wonderful converse, uh, correspondence. Uh, Frederick Douglass and, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. I mean, whatever one thinks of, of uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin in today's world, one has to look back and see this little frail white woman in the 1850s writing this book the first time saying that blacks were human. And it was so powerful a book that when she was met, when President Lincoln met her, he shook her hand and said, so you're the little woman that caused this great big war. Oh. It was that powerful. So when we look mm -hmm. at it today, it is wise not to say, oh, that's an Uncle Tom, and think that, that here's another label, wipe him out, mm -hmm. eradicate him. But all along, we have had chances among blacks and whites, among whites and Spanish-speaking among Asians and whites between all of us, we've had chances to reach and touch each other. We are somehow so underdeveloped um, as a species that I'm afraid, well, I'm afraid. I tell you, it's distressing to read what you have to say about uh, moving from Northern California to North Carolina to the South, yeah. where segregation we thought is much more than here, and you say you'd rather live in the South oh, yeah. than live in the North because we're hypocrites. Well, a number of people are hypocrites. I don't want to say everybody, you know. It's like saying every blonde is silly. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> please. Yeah. You We've know. heard that a few times. A few times. <laughs> you know it, and yeah. I can't stand that. Yeah, we prefer you not say that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> why don't we take a commercial break and we'll come back okay. and uh, talk. Thank you. We'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Let's address this. You seem to indicate that it's uh, easier is not the right word for a black person to live in the South than in the North, or the environment is much more beneficial to you. Well, um, first, one of the things that's seldom spoken of, of is, is the beauty of the South. The South is beautiful. Otherwise, people wouldn't have risked and lost their lives in the attempt to save it, hold it, take it from somebody or something. Um, also, for black people, for me, it is very sweet to be in the South. Whites who, um, who like one, a black person, or a black person, or feel themselves uh, liberal, will say so. Whites who do not will say so. In the North, in many cases, whites will have a public liberalness and a private racism. So it, it's just easier in a way. I don't say that, I mean, I, I've not always agreed that, um, that it's, it's awful or, or superficial for someone to say, have a nice day. Um, I, I really do prefer someone saying, have a nice day, even if it's hypocritical, to drop dead. You know, <laughs> there is that. 
but, um, but still, to live uh, in, a, in an atmosphere which one can trust is, is a very, it's relaxing. Dorothy. Um, you're, you're saying that it starts at home makes me think of the problems today of being a woman, being a mother, trying to have a career. I'd like your ideas about, I, I know you're, you are a mother, you raised a child, uh, and obviously you've achieved many things. How did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Can still... you be a superwoman? You, you seem like a superwoman no, to us. That, I know, but that's so, it's so awful. To, that's another label, you see. Uh, I am a mother and a grandmother, happily. Um, I, I think that sometimes women feel in order to, to have careers and to be also wonderful at home and thorough, uh, they have to be both male and female. I don't know. I mean, we are all male and female anyway. I don't think that uh, you have to take on the, uh, uh, the uh, trappings of a maleness. You see, to, uh, to be thorough and to be at once in the marketplace and at the same time at home. I think you start slowly. Now, there are those who can leap, but the same thing that's in the flea is in the turtle. You know, it may take the turtle a little longer. <laughs> so don't, don't try to make those incredible spans. Just little by little, be thorough and try to. I mean, everything you do is not going to be a success, you know. You have to forgive yourself and go on and do the best you can. And then when you do the best you can, compliment yourself. Compliment yourself. Let the rest of people do whatever they want to do. But you compliment yourself. You didn't good, kid. <laughs> you know? I Let, think so. Linda. Uh, I had the good fortune to hear you reading your poetry while I was driving the car. I pulled over <laughs> to you. listen. And there was a poem, I think, called Brown-Skinned Girl that was so wonderful. Maybe that was the name. I, I'm not sure. And I can't find it. I see. Now. It was about a girl going down to the water and. and oh, it was. Uh, she does not know her beauty. Oh, That's that not was my it. poem. I, I love it. It's Waring Cooney's poem. It. I love it. Oh, it was beautiful. It's a beautiful I thought it was poem. Yours. It's a, a black American male uh, poet writing in the 30s. Small poem called No Images, Waring Cooney. Oh, okay. Not at all. But Maya, you have a wonderful poem in your new collection about all different kinds of women. Yes. <laughs> Could we kind of maybe encourage you to read that? I would love to now. Yes! Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is called Seven Women's Blessed Assurance. First woman says, one thing about me, I'm little and low. Find me a man wherever I go. <laughs> the second woman says, they call me string bean. I'm so tall. Men see me, they ready to fall. <laughs> the third woman says, I'm young as morning, fresh as dew. Everybody loves me, so do you. <laughs> the fourth woman says, I'm fat as butter and sweet as cake. Men start to tremble every time I shake. <laughs> the fourth woman says, I'm little and lean, sweet to the bone. They like to pick me up and just carry me home. <laughs> the sixth woman says, when I passed 40, I dropped pretense, because men like women who got some sense. <laughs> OK, but here's my favorite for obvious reasons. 55 is perfect, so is 59 because every man needs to rest sometime. <laughs> we'll be right back. Ah. Kim, you had a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask Maya her views on interracial relationships. Oh, thank you. And first, I'm Miss Angelo. Miss Angelo. Yes, ma'am. I'm not Maya. I'm 62 years old. I have lived so long and tried so hard that a young woman like you or any other has no, you have no license 
to come up to me and call me by my first name. That's first. That's first. Also because at the same time, I am your mother, I'm your auntie, I'm your teacher, I'm your professor, you see? Um, it's very, the question is, what do I feel about interracial relationships? It is very hard to fall in love and stay there. If you fall in love with the fellow who lives next door, who, whose parents are friends with your parents, and the same race, and the same culture, and you've gone to the same church all your lives, and so forth, it is very hard for those two people to maintain an honorable relationship. I mean, two people from the same race and culture throughout the 40, 50 years of a marriage. It is more difficult if you come from separate, from other cultures. It's more difficult. But love is love. People fall in love. It, there is nothing one can do about falling in love. You may fall in love with a person who whose family is in feuding with your family. This is classic. One sees that in Romeo and Juliet. You see, when the Capulets, when these two families were warring. One sees that when Asian men fall in love with white women, when white men fall in love with Mexican women or black men fall in love with white women. People don't sit out and say, OK, I'm going to make it hard for myself. I'm going to go and fall in love with somebody I've got to to explain it to my people, I got to explain it to their people, I got to explain it to people in the street, I'm going to have to take care of all the children. I'm gonna... People don't set out to do that. But when they fall in love, I have the feeling that you ought to be grateful for it, respect it, honor it. That is my feeling. You um, just told her that she should call you Ms. Angelo. Ms. Angelo. Dr. Angelo, Dr. Professor Angelo. Angelo, Auntie. Is that part of the problem in this culture that we have? There's not enough discipline. There's not enough respect. Yes. There uh, is, pardon me? I said there's no respect what? in California. Hold, hold on, Senator. Well, Stand. Elders. I'm from North Carolina, and I'm, I'm so happy that you went back there. Thank you. Because it is a peaceful place. I've been out here in California about eight years, and there is no respect. Well, all right, sister. I agree. I only think that. The children know, know only what we teach them. If there is something wrong in the generations, which last two generations, which did not carry on the tradition, and I think this is true not just in the black community, this is true in the white community, in all the communities. We have not taken the children to our knees and told them the truth. Darling, here is the way it is. You live in direct res relation to the poets, the heroes, and the sheroes you have. Always honor the elders. Oh, then you honor yourself. Honor women. You honor yourself. Honor men. You honor yourselves. Watch your mouth. Watch what you say to, to another human being. Don't be so ready to be rude. You have to teach the children that. People don't jump up out of, out of uh, cribs, baby cribs, and know that. So somebody has not done the right thing. That's all I'm saying. And you know, it's, um, it's very difficult to be a teacher. And yet each one of us is a teacher. People are looking at every one of us. There are small people who watch you as you walk down the street. They say, oh, I like the way she walks. Oh, I like the way he talks. Did you see him turn that corner? You see how he wears his hair? People are watching. Small people are watching. So we're all teachers. But to take the responsibility for it to be a teacher is to call somebody and say, baby, come here. That's not right. Now, that's not right. That's not right. Now, you take a chance that the person will say, go to hell. <laughs> Excuse me, but it's true. But still, you have to take that chance with all the children, because they are all our children. The black ones, the white ones, the Asian, Spanish-speaking, Native American, Aleut, they are all our children. I take them for myself. All is mine. We will be back in only moment. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering how you feel about Malcolm X and the black Muslim movement. Hmm, those are two different things. Well, we 
whichever one you want yes. to talk about. Yes. <laughs> um, Malcolm X was a friend and brother to me. And I have written about him in All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes. And Alex Haley's book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, speaks of me and Malcolm. And Peter Goodman's book on Malcolm X has about 30 pages on our brother sisterhood. He was a brother friend to me. Um, I have dedicated books to him. He was a courageous and brilliant and very funny man. The aspect of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, which is most neglected, is that both of them were men of great humor as well as great heart. Um, the black Muslim movement in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s saved so many young black men and young black women, gave them focus, self-esteem, some sense of history, and some sense of the future, uh, and educated any number of men and women. When Malcolm X uh, left the movement, he left for personal reasons, which he made very public. Uh, he said he had gone to Mecca, and the, the same person who had said all whites were blue-eyed devils said after he went to Mecca, I find I was wrong. I have met men with blue eyes and blonde hair who I can sincerely call brother. Now, to be able to say that means that a person has gone through a particular kind of metamorphosis. And it takes a lot of courage to say to anybody, I mean, for an unknown person, not a fam famous person, to say, hey, everybody, you know what I said yesterday? I don't believe that anymore. It takes a great deal of courage to say nationally and internationally, say, folks, everything I've said, I believe, save this. I do not believe that anymore. Malcolm X was a man of great courage. And the Muslim movement has proved itself to be of in incredible importance in the black and other communities. All right? Yes, Darren. Um, you said, mentioned you were uh, raped as a child. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had any words for maybe people out there who were maybe abused in that way or other ways that still have not overcome it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, one doesn't overcome it. I don't think. I don't know. I don't think there's a day in my life I haven't thought about it. I mean, one overcomes it, yes, but what, I mean, one doesn't forget it. I think that one has to take the abuse and the abuser as single incidents, the abuser as a single person, and the, the event as a single incident in one's life. And one must not say, oh, then every person who looks like this is an abuser, you see. And every action toward me is going to be a replica of the event, a rep repetition of the event. One has to work really seriously with one's own intelligence and spirit to try to isolate it. It's like a a sore in the body. You can't say because I have a very bad knee, too, which I have, that the whole leg is bad, you see, or the whole body is corrupted or something. So I think that first you have to admit what happened. Admit to yourself what has happened. And then if you can, tell somebody. Tell a friend. Tell a parent. Tell a, and somebody in authority. Tell it. Speak it. Say it. That's, those are the things I would, I would encourage. And then someone who has much more expertise, much more qualifications than I, can encourage a person to deal with it. But you don't forget it, and don't expect that you ever will. Joe. Um, yeah, I recently read your book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Yes. And I was wondering, how can you look back on your childhood and remember it with hmm. such detail, because <laughs> I was only that like, young a few years ago, and I couldn't remember it that well. Well, I think that muteness had something to do with my memory. 
being a mute so many years, I used to think of myself as my whole body as an ear. <laughs> it's true. And I felt I could go into a room and just <laughs> take up all sound. I find that my brain changed itself, I think, in those years, physiologically. When I didn't speak, the brain probably said, you know, they say after, if you lose one sense, the other senses are enhanced. Well, my brain didn't have to deal with speaking. So that part of it might have shifted over to something else. Anyway, I seem to have total recall or none at all. I remember absolutely or I remember nothing. And we shall return. Latoya. Yes, Miss Angelo, I would like to know, well, my ninth grade English class just finished. I know why the cage bird sings. Yeah. And I would like to know, why did you rush through the ending? <laughs> and is there any particular reason you didn't put the father's name in the book? Ah, thank you. That's a lovely question. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Before I answer that, let me say um, to Kim, I apologize for being so short. I apologize. Uh, I'm not usually so short. It just caught me off guard. I saw you at 14. I thought, ooh. Well, but I apologize. The, um, I've never heard that said. That book was published before you were born, <laughs> 20 years ago. And to, I rushed through the ending. Well, hmm. I, I, I may have seemed to do so, Latoy, but the truth is I went on to write four more books. You see, in the same thing. So I was, maybe I was just trying to stop that so I could start the next book. I wouldn't have thought. I wanted to, I wanted to end on the most positive thing, event in my life, and that was the birth of my son. And it is still the most positive thing in my life I'm the most read black female writer in the world. I'm at, I teach in all sorts of languages and all sorts of disciplines, and I'm the this and the that, and the first black female director in Hollywood and many, many things. The most positive thing that ever happened to me was the birth of my son. He is the monument. If I have one in the, in the world, that is my monument. So I wanted to end there. Now, the father's name, the father had not agreed that he was the father of my child. So I at once did not want to either make him public, nor I didn't want to intrude, but at the same time, I didn't want to give him any of the glory. <laughs> well, Maya Angelou has a new book out, I Shall Not Be Moved, new poems that uh, she has written. As we go away this morning, and by the way, you are invited to our living room anytime <laughs> you wish to visit. Uh, as we go away this morning, would you read uh, uh, the poem, Human Family, I would be for glad us? To. And thank you for being here, too. Thank you, everybody. And the truth is I'm one of the most read black female writers in the world. <laughs> I keep talking too much and too fast. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious, some thrive on comedy, some declare their lives are lived as true profundity, and others claim, no, they really live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse, bemuse, delight, brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land and seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women named Jane or Mary Jane, but I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mirror twins are different, although their features jibe, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. We love and lose in China, we weep on England's moors, laugh and moan in Guinea, and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine. In minor ways we differ, in major we are the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. 
we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike.